Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for today's webinar, Implementation of a Syringe Services Program and Law Enforcement Barriers. My name is Katie Bailey, and I'm a project manager at the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice, a community-based research center that provides local communities, organizations, and behavioral health and law enforcement agencies in Michigan and Indiana with technical assistance evaluation and support to optimize diversion of individuals from jail and prison through the implementation of best and innovative practices at every intercept of the criminal justice continuum. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. Um, today's event will highlight the findings from a series of studies assessing the impact of a felony possession law on the success of the syringe services program in Marion County, Indiana, and the well being of the community as a whole, with results highlighting the need to decriminalize syringe possession in Indiana. Uh, before we get started, uh, I have a, a few housekeeping items. Audiovisual capabilities have been turned off for attendees to limit distractions throughout the presentation, but we encourage you to ask questions. Um, you can do so. You can enter your questions in the Q&A box on your screen at any time. We will address the questions as time permits during the roundtable discussion portion um, at the end of the event. If you are calling from a phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand and ask a question um, at the end at the Q and A portion at the end of the event. So, so I will introduce our, our presenters more in depth before they speak. But um, just to start off, um, these are the next. This slide and the next slide are uh, pictures of our presenters. Um, with us today is Madison Weintraut, Emily Seitz, Dr. Brad Ray, Sergeant Ronald Martin, Corey Davis, and Captain Kevin Hunter. Next slide, please. So we're going to start off with Madison Weintraut. She is the program manager of Safe Syringe Access and Support, Marion County's first legal syringe services program. Prior to delivering harm reduction resources to individuals with substance use disorder, Madison worked as a nurse epidemiologist specializing in hepatitis B and C for Marion County Public Health Department at, and as a nurse at St. Vincent's Neonatal Intensive Care Unit. Madison obtained her Bachelor of Science in Neurobiology and Physiology from Purdue University, her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from Marion University, and her Master of Public Health from Indiana University. Take it away, Madison. Thanks, Katie. Next slide. Syringe service programs have been operating in the United States uh, since the 1980s when HIV was discovered. So now we have nearly 40 years of research to show that we know they're one of the most effective ways to prevent the spread of infectious diseases from syringe sharing and reuse. And there are actually more than 360 syringe service programs in the United States as of last year. Uh, with some states like Indiana, uh, we have a home rule law, which means we only have a handful of programs. Other states like Kentucky have a program in almost every county, or we have states like New Mexico that have a more centralized statewide program. And while we have this abundance of information about syringe services, they're always surrounded by a lot of misconceptions. Next slide, please. I think there's some automation. <laughs> syringe services, uh, you know, always have these misconceptions. The most common one is typically that they're gonna increase drug use, that they promote drug use. I can tell you, no one ever started injecting drugs because a syringe exchange exists. Just as the lack of having a syringe exchange never stopped anyone from injecting. And in the past three years, I've seen syringes that are rigged out of duct tape and hot glue. I've heard people say that before they had access to syringes, they were using the same one for months over and over again each day until it finally broke off in their arm or even their neck. Uh, people go to Rural King and buy bovine, or bovine syringes, which are huge to inject. So not having a syringe service program doesn't stop people from injecting and having one doesn't give somebody permission to start. Uh, so in contract to, contrast to this misconception, people that participate in syringe services are five times more likely to go into treatment and three times more likely to stop injecting drugs because of the non-judgmental, non-coercive environment that we promote. 
We know that self-motivation is one of the greatest predictors for recovery success. And syringe services allow people who inject drugs to have the autonomy to make that decision to move forward with, with treatment themselves. We also know that syringe services don't increase crime. Um, actually, in some neighborhoods where they exist, you see a decrease. People don't want to come to the syringe exchange and hang out and um, try to find ways to steal or make money there. They want to get their stuff and they want to get out of Dodge. We also know that they don't um, increase the amount of syringes discarded in the community. In fact, for most people, it's the first opportunity that they really have to dispose of syringes properly. So with syringe exchange, every single person is provided with a sharps container. They are responsible for bringing not only their used syringes, but any that they find in the community back to the program, syringe service programs, then dis uh, dispose of those syringes in um, a way that's compliant with hazardous material disposal. Uh, it is not a danger to the community. So a couple of years ago, we did um, a very large community cleanup. We did like a two mile radius around the locations where our program operates. And we collected over 200 bags of trash and we only found one syringe. And actually that syringe was found by a reporter. So I'm not even sure uh, if it was really there to begin with, maybe it was. Um, but I think one syringe for 200 bags of trash really says something. And finally, um, syringe exchanges seem to be costly to the taxpayer. That's not true at all. Um, in fact, for every $1 that's spent on syringe services, up to $7.58 is saved in HIV treatment costs alone. So that doesn't include the costs of people that have to go to the emergency room for abscesses or overdoses. It doesn't include the cost of hospitalizations for sepsis. It doesn't include the cost for um, treatment of hepatitis C, which nearly 80% or as many of 80% of people who inject drugs end up getting. Uh, both federal law and Indiana state law prohibit the use of those taxpayer dollars to go towards the purchase of syringes for syringe exchange, uh, which means that most syringes are purchased entirely pr from private funding, uh, which is totally in contrast with the cost of treating somebody for HIV, which often is supplemented with taxpayer dollars. Next slide, please. Syringe exchange in Indiana uh, started in 2015 following the um, infamous HIV outbreak in Scott County, Indiana. Uh, as I said, we're a home rule state. So now um, post 2015, in order to start a program, a county or a city has to prove the need. So we have to demonstrate that there's an outbreak of HIV or hepatitis C related to injection drug use. And in 2017 in Marion County, it became very easy to do that. We actually had a 1000% increase in acute hepatitis C cases between 2013 and 2017. 95% of those cases we know were related to substance use. Um, and then we were able to show that at least 86% of them were related to injection drug use. The CDC estimates that for every case of hepatitis C that's diagnosed, as many as 14 other cases are being transmitted in the community and just we don't know about it yet. We also know that rises in acute hepatitis C usually precede a rise in HIV related to injection drug use. Um, Scott County um, started seeing an increase in their hepatitis C numbers just, I think, two years before the HIV outbreak. We know if Marion County had an outbreak related to injection drug use of HIV, uh, like that in Scott County, which was a 45-fold increase, we would be talking about an additional 500 cases of new HIV on top of what usually happens in just one year. And that would cost the city about $500 million or half of our annual budget. So as I said before, we know that syringe exchanges are not only effective at preventing HIV, but they're also extremely cost-effective while doing so. Next slide, please. So we launched Safe Syringe Access and Support in April of 2019. We started out as just a big box truck that went to locations throughout the city that had demonstrated a need based on overdoses on where people were getting arrested for drug related crimes where they're getting diagnosed with HIV and hepatitis C. Uh, we provide our services anonymously um, in agreement with Indiana law. So participation is anonymous. So in order to track our participants and also provide a, a form of authentication for law enforcement our participants are provided with a unique identifier and ID card uh, for them to come back and we can follow um, the progression of, uh, of their um, time in the program. I've often heard uh, 
syringe exchanges compared to after school pizza parties for uh, for kids. So the former medical director of Indiana used to use that analogy and I really like it. Uh, so kids go to the pizza party for pizza and they leave with their homework done. Well, the core of syringe exchange is yes, the syringes, but we also offer a variety of other services. So uh, people are able to be referred to treatment. They can get tested for HIV and hepatitis C. We have immunizations for hepatitis A, hepatitis B, HPV, flu, Tdap, and um, as of Friday, we will have COVID vaccinations there as well. Uh, people get naloxone, condoms, um, access to health insurance. And actually, uh, participants in certain service programs are some of the best responders for overdoses. Since we launched, our participants have reversed over 380 overdoses. So that's 380 times that 911 didn't have to be called, that police, fire, EMS, whoever did not have to go respond and provide naloxone and they could then be available for other emergencies in the community. And that's 380 lives that get a chance at recovery now. So while people come to the syringe exchange for the syringes, they leave knowing their HIV status. They leave armed with an naloxone so they can respond in emergency. And they leave immunized against other infectious diseases like hepatitis A. Our program is also staffed by peer recovery coaches who are individuals that are able to use their own lived experience to help our participants reduce barriers to recovery and set goals um, to improve their well-being. And over the past few months, I've been doing a survey with our participants that asked, you know, other than syringes, what is the most important part of the program? So, you know, is it that you can get free testing? Is it that you can get free immunizations? Um, and the answer is always, always, it's the people um, that bring me back. So being able to have staff that can relate to our clients, that can welcome them and motivate them is really instrumental to our program success and to kind of moving the needle for people um, who, uses, who use drugs health um, along that spectrum. And actually, since we put this presentation together, we've actually now served over a thousand unique clients, which is really cool. Um, and that's a thousand people that are now taking more accountability for their well being. And they're able to interact regularly with a peer recovery coach to set those goals and are able to access healthcare that otherwise they may not have had access to before. Next slide. Our next presenter is Emily Seitz. She is a project coordinator at the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice and works on multiple studies. Uh, sorry. She um, works on multiple studies related to medications for opioid use disorder, police mental health co-response teams, naloxone and peer recovery coaching. Emily specializes in qualitative data collection and community relations. Emily received her Bachelor of Science in Community Health and her Master of Public Health from Indiana University. Go ahead, Emily. Sorry, I was muted. Um, thanks, Katie, and thanks, Madison, for that um, intro, um, providing a little bit of background about syringe exchange programs in general, but then also the one specifically in Marion County. Hopefully, you guys are somewhat familiar with that program. Um, and if not, you got some info about it. So uh, my name is Emily. A um, Couple of things I'm gonna talk about today. Um, next slide, please. So the first thing I wanna talk about is um, these educational sessions that we had for uh, Indianapolis law enforcement, um, IMPD specifically. So I think in the month prior to the program starting, so this was in March of 2019, um, myself and some other members of our research team and then Madison, we visited um, IMPD roll call presentations. And um, so we went to the ones that start at like, what, like 4.30, 5.30, and then the afternoon ones and then the evening ones. Um, and we gave um, just an educational presentation about um, the program specific to Marion County and then just syringe exchange programs in general. So just some general info about the benefits of syringe exchange programs, um, why one is gonna start in Marion County and what it's going to look like. So just to keep law enforcement in the loop because again, syringe possession is a felony in Indiana. So 
in these educational sessions, we um, also talked about the participant um, participation card. So it's pictured there on your screen, but each participant um, of the program gets one of these cards and it has an ID number um, that is unique to them. I think Madison touched on this as well. Um, and so the idea of these cards is because you know, we have this felony law in place. If it did happen that a person got stopped by a police officer and they had syringes with them, the idea is that they could show this car to police and kind of um, give a, a reasoning for having these syringes with them. And although we tell people it's not a get out of jail free card, that maybe it could work in their favor just to, again, just kind of keep police in the loop. Um, and let them know that this person has syringes for this reason. And then, you know, it, it's still up to the officer discretion as to, you know, what they want to do from there. Um, so one of the main reasons, again, to educate officers about these cards is to let them know this is what we're doing to kind of um, be a workaround of, uh, around this felony um, possession law. But, you know, again, it is up, ultimately, you know, up to the officer. Um, so we did do a, after we gave this educational training, it's not really a training, it was more of an educational session. Um, we had a post survey. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So we had um, 339 respondents who completed the survey and the survey just kind of asked about officer attitudes towards syringe exchange programs. Um, their experience with needle stick injuries and just kind of their anticipated impact of what the program might be on the community. Um, and as you can see on the screen, um, there were generally positive um, feelings towards the program from respondents um, with 80% indicating they think the program will help reduce the spread of hepatitis. 74% indicating they think it would be good for the community and then 65% just having a general positive impression of the program. So that was great. Um, those findings were really um, promising. Um, however, in addition to these findings, a little under half of officers um, indicated that they don't really know that much about syringe exchange programs. And again, it was a brief um, training session. So that's understandable. And then a little over half of officers indicated that the program would promote drug use, which um, of course, you know, there isn't necessarily any research to back that up. So that was kind of a, a misconception that was still kind of out there even after having these educational sessions. And then another interesting finding was that those who had experience with a needle stick injury were definitely more critical of the program, which is understandable. Um, so next slide. So to kind of address some of these um, lingering misconceptions and just feelings that maybe officers don't totally know a lot about syringe exchange programs and you know the benefits of them. Um, researchers from Wayne State University partnered with researchers at Northeastern University and um, Indiana Department of Health to implement SHIELD for Indiana. So SHIELD was created at Northeastern University. It's um, basically occupational safety training in the context of the opioid overdose and opioid ever overdose epidemic and now the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and just provide safety tips, but also education with some harm reduction sprinkled in there, um, just in the context of overdose because law enforcement are at the front lines of the overdose epidemic and that's not changing. Um, so we have implemented a few SHIELD trainings so far. Um, we did one in December of 2020, and then we did one in March of 2021. Um, they're virtual, it's about two hours, um, and we have officers from all over Indiana. Next slide. So from the two trainings that we did recently, we had 167 officers attend. Um, and with these SHIELD trainings, we have what we call Indiana ambassadors who are from different agencies in Indiana who kind of speak to Indiana specific data and Indiana specific um, issues with uh, Madison being one of these ambassadors. Um, so again, we had 167 officers attend, which is great. Um, before 
the training and after the training, we have surveys. So a pre-training survey and a post-training survey. So um, using data from these trainings, the pre and post survey data, we found that um, after the training, um, officers had improved attitudes and opinions about persons who use drugs, harm reduction, and just opioid addiction in general, which is great. Um, in, in particular, after the training, officers were less likely, likely to believe that syringe exchange programs condone drug use, more likely to believe that legal possession of syringe um, would promote trust and honesty during police citizen interactions, and more likely to believe that in the future, they might use their discretion not to arrest for syringe possession. So um, overall, very promising findings. Um, it's open to all police officers and our next training is June 22nd for um, anyone on the call who wants to attend. Um, I can put my email in the chat and anyone can email me if you want an invite or you want more information about SHIELD. Um, next slide, please. So the last thing I wanna talk about are um, qualitative interviews that, we, that I did with um, members of the syringe exchange program. So I was on the van for a couple of months. Madison was nice enough to let me on the van for a little bit. And I was there to recruit participants to participate in a one-time interview. Um, it was a phone interview. It was about 20 minutes long and participants were compensated with a gift card for participating. And really, I just wanted to learn more about, um, sorry. That's a great question, Nancy. Um, thanks for your questions. I think we will be answering questions at the end, um, but that's a great question. Um, so I did 27 phone interviews with 30 participants. And again, kind of the main goal of these interviews was just to learn more about their experiences with the program, but also kind of learn more about being a participant of a syringe exchange program in the context of Indiana having a felony possession law for syringes. Um, next slide, please. So just some general findings to start. Um, so I'm not going to read these quotes like word for word. You guys feel free to read them. And I think um, these slides will be shared at the end of the event. So if you don't catch something, don't worry about it. Um, so overall positive perceptions of the program among participants. Um, excuse me. In particular, a really great thing is a lot of participants reported that before the program, they had to share syringes or reuse syringes, but now they no longer have to because they have access to clean um, syringes, you know? So um, next slide. Some other just general findings. Participants um, reported that they were happy that they had a place to safely dispose of their used syringes without you know, having to discard them wherever they could. Um, because each participant gets a sharps container that they can use to um, throw away their uh, used syringes. So they, you know, they're not, we reduce the risk of, you know, needle sick injuries in the community. And kind of what Madison touched on, a lot of participants reported um, increased access to treatment and other resources as a part of the um, program. And then, you know, just having that constant interaction with peer recovery coaches. Next slide. So again, one of the main things I also wanted to kind of talk with participants about is, you know, what happens if you are stopped by a police officer and you have syringes with you? And um, with these, the results here, one thing I want to point out is I don't want to, um, you know, blame police officers for anything because I understand with it being a felony, you know, it is what it is. Um, the law needs to be changed. So um, this is just kind of how, how are you a participant in the context of syringes being a felony possession? So seven individuals that I talked to indicated that they'd been stopped by police with syringes on them. And um, of these individuals, of these seven individuals, six were arrested and all but one person showed police their participation card. So with this also, um, you know, we have these participation cards, which is great, and that's kind of our workaround. However, as these results show, um, it, it's just, it's 
it's just that it's a workaround it's a band-aid it's it's not really fixing the problem because you know participants are getting arrested so um, even after you know by the participant standards are doing everything right um, and you know it's just it's just not working um, next slide and some more um, quotes here from participants who um, were arrested. And again, it's just that they're, they're not able to use the program to its full potential and to, you know, really benefit from from the syringe exchange program when there is kind of this threat of a felony charge always kind of there. Um, next slide. However, that's just not to say that every interaction with police is negative. Um, a lot of participants also said that they had really great interactions with police and police fully supported what they were doing and you know and they had that conversation of you know tell me if you have a needle and let's just go from there so and these people didn't have an arrest or anything like that so um again this is just all kind of to say that it's hard to implement a program like this when you have a felony possession law in place and i think these interviews are kind of evidence of that and Brad and others are going to touch more on that. Um, so again, some positive and some negative um, interactions with police, but um, generally just you know wanted to point out that what we're doing now was just kind of a band aid to a real solution. Uh, next slide. And I think that's it for me. Thank you, Emily. Our next speaker is uh, Brad Ray. Dr. Ray joined Wayne State University School of <laughs> as a uh, associate professor and director of the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice in 2019. He received his PhD in sociology from North Carolina State University in 2012 and served as research director at the Indiana University Public Policy Institute for seven years. He is a community engaged researcher who focuses on mental health and substance use disorder, particularly where these populations intersect with the criminal legal system. Much of his recent research has focused on evaluating policies and interventions aimed at the recent overdose epidemic and translating evidence based strategies into practice. Dr. Ray joins us today to provide an overview of the overdose crisis and explain how the Center for Behavioral Health and Justice is responding. Thanks, Katie. Had a coughing attack there. <clears throat> so um, just by way of additional introduction, I lived there in Indianapolis for seven years. I was a professor at IUPUI. I moved there in 2012. And one of the first collaborations that I started was with the deputy coroner, Elfie McGinty. She and I started a project where we started to collect real-time uh, toxicology results that were coming in from accidental drug overdose deaths. <clears throat> So we would collect the information from the toxicology results, as well as some information uh, from the death certificates themselves. And again, this is just accidental drug overdose deaths. We don't collect uh, the toxicology results on other types of um, uh, deaths, poisoning related deaths. Uh, so I wanted to just start out by showing you this data and talk a little bit about what this information tells us about the overdose epidemic in Marion County. Next slide, please. So if you can see those uh, bars in the back there, those are the number of overdose deaths that are occurring in Marion County by year. So you can see that in 2018, that was the first reduction that we had seen. This corresponded to reductions that, have, that were detected nationally as well. Uh, and then in 2020, the highest number of overdose deaths ever in Marion County, 515 overdose deaths, certainly due uh, in part to COVID. But what I want to uh, also illustrate is the lines that are on this figure. Those lines, and you can see the indicator over there to the left, those lines uh, indicate the percentage uh, of which those substances were detected in these overdose deaths. So keep in mind, these are not mutually exclusive. Most overdose deaths have multiple substances in them. But we hear a lot about, just as an example, methamphetamine. You can see at the 2010, methamphetamine is at that bottom line there. Um, and then when you look at 2020, meth was detected in 20, or I'm sorry, 30% of overdose deaths. So it's more than doubled in the past five years. But the line that I really want to draw your attention to is uh, the red line, which is fentanyl. This is illicitly produced fentanyl. Uh, our research suggests that much of the heroin in Marion County has uh, fentanyl in it. 
Uh, but you can see there that, that that substance is really driving the overdose rate. And in 2020, of the 515 overdose deaths experienced in Marion County, 80% uh, of them contain the same substance, and that is uh, fentanyl. So what I want to do is just talk a little bit about um, how we've used this data in other studies so you get a sense of what's in there and, and sort of validate it for you. So next slide, please. It was probably about six or seven years ago, Dr. Uh, Alex Cohen, who is with the Fairbanks Foundation in Indianapolis, there was at a meeting much like this and said to me, Brad, why do your numbers look different than the CDC's numbers? And I knew that we use slightly different methodologies, uh, but I really didn't have an answer to that. So we ended up using the toxicology data that we were collecting and we linked it up to the ICD codes that are used by the CDC. And what we ended up doing was um, revealing massive undercounting of opioid related overdose deaths. Um, and as you can see there, about 58% of the overdose deaths during that time period were coded as unspecified. Um, and 86% of those contained an opioid, prescription opioids, heroin, fentanyl, a variety of different things. So we ended up using these data to uh, calculate adjustments for undercounting across the state and nationally. Dr. Cohen worked on that with me, and now we still do work with the Indiana Department of Health, which doing incredible work actually reducing uh, those number of unspecified overdose deaths in the state of Indiana. Um, next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, you know, no overdose death is not, I shouldn't say no, but very few overdose deaths are the result of one single substance. So another thing that we try and do with these overdose data is visualize polydrug overdose deaths. And so what you can see here is we use social network analysis to visualize these multiple substances that are detected. That top subgroup are uh, white decedents, that bottom group are uh, black decedents. The size of those uh, nodes, those circles, are the, represent how often those substances were detected in that subgroup. And the thickness of the lines between them illustrate how often there was a combination. And in this paper, what we were trying to point out was that um, there was a, a, a growing trend in postmortem toxicology results uh, between um, fentanyl and cocaine amongst African Americans. And so you can see that line starts to get thicker between 2015 and 2018. Next slide, please. But in this study, one other thing that we did was we linked up all of the overdose data uh, to EMS records in Marion County. And by doing that, we were able to show you know, amongst those individuals who died, 12% uh, um, had some prior non-fatal overdose response from EMS, and about 10%, 9.4% uh, had naloxone administered. But we were able to find uh, show that their, their uh, white decedents were significantly more likely to have had a prior non-fatal overdose um, than black decedents. And so now I want to talk a little bit about um, how we ended up using these data in, a, in our study of the syringe services program. So uh, next slide, please. So big shout out to my buddy, Phil Wen for making this great uh, timeline here. And so just to walk you through this, um, what we ended up doing to, to monitor the syringe service programs um, implementation is we were getting uh, data from the jail on uh, uh, bookings into the jail facility that were syringe related. And so you can see that blue line at the top when somebody's booked into jail, it could be for one charge and it could be for 10 charges, right? And if any of those charges were syringe related, then that's that blue line. And you can see in Marion County per month, it was between 200 and 250 jail bookings where there was a syringe uh, um, charge in that booking. That red line at the bottom is if the person was booked into the jail just on a syringe related charge, no other charges as part of that booking event. <clears throat> and you can see they're averaging about 50 um, uh, per month in 2017. Those vertical lines are events that occurred over time. That first vertical line is when Dr. Virginia Kane announced the syringe service program opening. And you can see that's really where we saw the first reductions in the arrest of uh, or booking of people for syringe, uh, syringes in Marion County. You can see that thicker gray line there is where the training that Emily referred to earlier that we conducted. And then when the program opened is the line after that or the vertical line. And you can see there were some inconsistent reductions there afterwards. Uh, but the next big jump down, if you will, was uh, the impact of COVID. And, you know, it, it kind of goes without saying, but just so folks know, you know, jail bookings decreased a lot during COVID, almost in half. So if you would have looked at like May of 2019 to see how many individuals were booked into the jail in that month, it would have been around 4,000. If you would have looked at May 2020, it would have been half of that. So bookings in general went down. Uh, but as you can see there, 
even in the midst of a global pandemic, there was still about 25 individuals per month booked into the jail just on a syringe related charge um, uh, in 2020 there. So um, uh, next slide, please. So much like we did with the EMS data and the overdose data, what we wanted to do is link these two data sets and see where there's an intersection between these syringe related bookings and overdose fatalities. For those of you that don't know, there's just been some really uh, remarkable studies done in this area that consistently show overdose is the leading cause of death for people leaving incarceration facilities, jail and prison. And the, uh, the majority of these overdose deaths are opioid related. And part of that is just the mechanism of opioid addiction. So for those of you who don't know, I won't do a great job explaining this, but just briefly, uh, when people use opioids, they rapidly develop a tolerance. They require more opioids to feel those euphoric effects, and they build up a tolerance. When they go through a um, voluntary or involuntary, like jail, period of abstinence, their tolerance rapidly decreases. And if they go back to using, and they use at those uh, dosage levels from before, but, uh, when they were had a high tolerance, they're very likely to overdose and die. Um, the, with, especially without you know, naloxone medications and other um, uh, mitigating factors. So the seminal US study done here was done by Binswanger and colleagues found after controlling for demographic factors, individuals released from uh, prison in Washington state had 129 times the risk of overdose in the first two weeks post-release um, relative to the general population. So what we realized is that we had a really unique opportunity to look at this question very specifically in Marion County. So next slide, please. This study was led by Dr. Grant Victor, and it was set up to be uh, a cohort study. And this is very relevant for how I'll explain the results of this, but um, essentially what we did is we looked at every single person who left the Marion County Jail in the year uh, 2017. So you can see about 28,000 individuals. If somebody left the jail twice that year, we would have used their most recent event. So if they left in January and December, we would have used that December event. And then what we did is we created a count uh, of the number of bookings that each individual had in the two years prior. So how many times had they been booked in the jail before? And then we linked that to overdose records uh, from January 2017 all the way through the end of December 2019. And you can see there 237 of those uh, uh, deaths that occurred during that period were folks that were coming out of the jail in that year, 2017. And we used uh, which a survival analysis approach, uh, Cox regression survival analysis that predicts the hazard uh, of events occurring. Um, next slide, please. One, one caveat I wanna mention is in those other studies, um, they use what's called, the, the studies I was reviewing before, they use what's called all cause mortality. So they could look at death from anything post-release. Keep in mind, we're just looking at accidental overdose post-release from jail, not other types of mortality that might have occurred. And what we found in those Cox regression survival uh, models though, was that controlling for age, race, and gender, each additional booking into the Marion County Jail increased the hazard of overdose mortality by 20%. Individuals who were booked into the jail on a syringe-related charge had three times the risk of death than those who were just in the jail for other charges. So you can see here a very high risk of overdose, especially for individuals who are being booked into the facility for syringe-related charges. What we also realized, though, is given the overdose data that we had, we, we, we could look at who died once they were released, but also ask what proportion of all of the deaths that are occurring in Marion County are the folks that are coming out of the jail, out of this jail cohort. Next slide, please. So you can see in 2017, there were 406 overdose deaths in Marion County. 21% of those deaths, 80, 85 of those deaths were individuals who were in that 2017 jail release cohort. In 2018, there were 361 deaths in Marion County. 20% of those deaths were individuals who were released from the Marion County Jail in 2017. In 2019, 22% of all of the overdose deaths in Marion County were people who were released from the jail in 2017. Many of these individuals were booked again. Um, and also I should say, 
you know, in 2018, that doesn't account for the individuals that were released then. In 2017, just as it doesn't account for those that were released in 2016, uh, what we find is that amongst individuals who overdose, more than 60% of them have had some stay in that jail. So, uh, next slide, please. That is 237 lives that could have been averted, uh, where action could have been taken to try and reduce the risk of mortality, um, things that could have been done, right? And if you think of the overdose rate in Marion County that I showed you earlier on, when, I, when you think of the fact that people are being booked into the jail right now, um, there is a real opportunity um, for intervention. But certainly uh, reducing and, and stopping the arrest of individuals with substance use disorder, stopping the, the arrest of individuals for the possession of a syringe would be an ideal policy solution. But there are also more immediate responses that can be done within the jail facility. So the research out there tells us that by implementing medications for opioid use disorder in a jail facility, it can reduce overdose deaths by up to 30%. This isn't the kind of thing you need a new facility for. This is something that can be implemented um, in the current facility, right? You can see, and I just think it's always really important to point this out, there are three FDA approved medications. All three of these should be uh, uh, provided. Patient preference is incredibly important here. Those three medications are buprenorphine, also known as Suboxone or Subuclade, Methadone or Naltrexone, also known as Vivitrol. Um, the recent comparative effectiveness studies are telling us that buprenorphine and Methadone outperform Naltrexone, especially with illicit drugs. Um, so getting all of these medications in there could have a huge impact. Additionally, providing naloxone to every single person who leaves the jail facility could help to reduce some of these deaths as well. Research in this says that the people that are leaving the jail facility are around individuals who are likely to overdose and are capable of saving their lives. So there's a lot that can be done. We can uh, get back into this in the Q&A. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Ron now. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Our next presenter is Sergeant Ron Martin. Ronald Martin is a board member and currently works as a part-time law enforcement consultant for the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. He is a retired law enforcement professional with over 20 years of experience in the New York City Police Department. He supports the incorporation of harm reduction and evidence-based practices within the public safety community by teaching officers about diversion programs, overdose prevention, needle stick safety, the administration of naloxone and the benefits of syringe exchange programs. He promotes equal stakeholder relationships between public and behavioral health officials, rural community initiatives and faith based programs. He advocates. Um, sorry, he advocates for increased dialogue between people who use drugs, sex workers and law enforcement to create safer communities. In his spare time, he enjoys watching sports and all films that are science fiction, horror, or those that include comic book superheroes. Take it away, uh, Sergeant Martin. Thank you, Katie. I appreciate that introduction. Um, I want to start by just basically like letting everyone know about a musical that started in the mid-1990s. It was called Rent. And they made reference to a lyric that said, 525,600 minutes, how do you measure a year in the life? Well, one thing that I'm aware of is that in 2017, 72,000 people died as a result of overdose deaths. In 2018, it was 68,000. 2019, the number jettisoned back up to over 80,000. And we're probably going to have a clear overdose death high um, this particular year, 2020, and it's going to be somewhere well over 100,000 overdose deaths. Now, I've always been a pretty competitive person. And for the most part, I understand the difference between winning and losing. What I would say right now is that right now we are effectively losing too many people to the way we're handling this particular crisis. Now, anecdotally, I'm reminded of another competitive person. And this is a fictional character named James Tiberius Kirk. Kirk was the captain of the Star Trek um, fictional series. The Enter he was captain of the Enterprise on the Star Trek show. While Kirk was going to what would be the equivalent of a police academy or what was his Starfleet Academy, Kirk basically um, had to take a test. And his test was called the Kobayashi Maru. The test was specifically designed for people to fail the exam. It wasn't designed for him to pass the exam. 
Okay, so now Kirk started taking the test. He took the test once, he failed. He took the test twice, he failed, as he was supposed to, because the test was specifically designed to see what type of integrity and character you had if you, in fact, failed this exam. Upon taking the test on the third attempt, um, Kirk decided, I'm not built this particular way. This is not the way I want to be perceived. So what he did was he entered the computer room, he cheated on the, the, the software of the exam to make the test winnable, took the test the next day, and he passed. He was reprimanded, obviously, because he cheated, but he was also applauded because he decided to do things differently. He decided to get a different effect, a different result by doing something a little bit differently. In 1971, President Richard Nixon received a memo across his death that 15% of the returning veterans from the Vietnam War were suffering from some type of substance use disorder problem. At that particular time, 15% were returning back and there was a, a, a overuse of heroin. At that particular moment, President Nixon declared what we now refer to as the war on drugs. And this war on drugs two years later prompted the commencement of an agency, which is the DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency. And it increased and stepped up everything regarding forfeitures, um, confiscations, um, um, incarcerating folks that were connected to distributing, trafficking, trafficking, selling, or for that matter, possessing any form of, of narcotic. This type of behavioral stance and now what is the law enforcement community continued through the 70s as it combated heroin and cocaine. It moved into the 80s as we were introduced to crack cocaine. All right, and then it started around two thousand two year 2000 with the overprescription of drugs and op opioids and oxycodone and hydrocodone and the like, which ultimately transitioned into the usage of what we see right now, which is heroin and fentanyl and the like, synthetics. So I say all of this to say, that there is one prevailing consensus that moves through the law enforcement community. And that simply is that of, we will not be able to arrest our way out of this particular problem. We've been doing it for 50 years now and we're getting the same result. And that result ends up being unsuccessful. So the question is, if that is the case, how do we commit to a shift in the paradigm? How do we create a, a, a change in the process? Or how do we simply just evolve to a different way of doing things. 2011, there was a, a problem in Seattle, Washington. The problem was there was an abundance of narcotics being used and there were a significant amount of narcotics arrests being made. The problem was at the particular time, there was a disparity, a racial disparity to who, the, who the, was being affected by the arrest. So a combination of like governmental organizations and Seattle Police Department came together and created an organization or prompted the creation of an organization called LEAD, a program, LEAD, Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. It's not diversion away from drug use. It's diversion away from the criminal justice system. system. It's a program that works with equal stakes, stakeholder relationships, where the faith-based community, judges, prosecutors, um, police, um, residents of the community are all very much aware of the fact that someone, someone is using drugs, but basically, if they haven't committed a felony, it's only a misdemeanor charge. It's nothing too serious, all right? It's not a crime against police. That basically, they can go through an intake pro process, which will bring them into a program where they'll receive wraparound services, which could be anything from residential, drug treatment, um, um, food assistance, educational training, um, and more importantly, once again, I'll say it again, treatment options, okay? This program continued on, but it had one major harm reduction piece that was significant to how it functioned. And this harm reduction piece was, is that it met people where they were at. It met people where they're, where they're at, which means that if you were using drugs in your life, it wasn't a prerequisite that you stop using drugs in order to remain in the program. I'll come back to that in a second. This harm reduction thing, well, well what exactly is it? More importantly, I'll say, well, kind of like what led me to this harm reduction thing? Well, part of this harm reduction element is the fact that it does pertain to substance use. It is a component of, of it's a core belief that basically says that be it illicit or be it legal or illegal drugs, drug use is a part of our world. So we need to incorporate a way of mitigating the risk of any harmful effects that comes from drug use. So the question then becomes, well, if we're doing this, does that mean that we're actually allowing people to use drugs? Well, in fact, we're going to meet them where they're at. And we're going to help them make the incremental changes that they can make in the moment that they can. 
Now, how does that bring me into it? And out of full transparency, I have to say, I live in the state of North Carolina. I come from North Carolina. I've done a lot of work nationally throughout the country, including Indiana, all right? But primarily what I want to refer to is like just changes that have taken place and how they were structured in, 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 in North Carolina. But that still brings up one huge mystery. And that's just a little bit about me. I'm a retired detective sergeant from the New York City Police Department. My last three years, I worked in a, a bureau called the Organized Crime Control Bureau. I worked in Brooklyn North Narcotics. I had a high enforcement team that basically conducted buy and bust operations every single day. My team led search warrant executions for a period of six months running. We worked mid-level cases that confiscated up to uh, multiple kilos of cocaine and millions of dollars. So enforcement for a 21 year period on a 20 year retirement there, basically my entire career was enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. This transition, this epiphany didn't come about until September 11, 2001. We're working two months down to ground zero, being a first responder and seeing that the city was under a specter of death from these planes going into the towers and all the multiple, mul multitude of lives that were lost there in the fields of Pennsylvania at the Pentagon, that basically I realized that a lot of my day-to-day -day work consisted of basically locking people up for weed, arresting people for something a little bit more minuscule. There was crack cocaine, there was heroin, there was paraphernalia all the time. But the bottom line is the paraphernalia ended up becoming like a, a catch-all, a catch-all to saying, well, this is what we have today. And that was the offense. That was the statute that was there. They were a misdemeanor statute. This made it easy looking at that specter of death during 2000, 2001 and basically coming out and saying, I need to find a greater balance. Now, I don't want you to think that there was some type of really like um, epiphany of a progressiveness or, or liberalness that came out of me. The real truth about it is I believe you commit a felony, you, you commit a crime against a person, you need to go to jail. You need to be punished for your actions. But at the same time, I do also believe that we need to take a stronger look at how we're incarcerating people for lesser offenses, all right? In this particular instance, without declaring the rights or the wrongs of it, I'll simply say that my belief is, is that syringes would be one of those lesser offenses. It falls back to what typically would be misdemeanor type paraphernalia. And even there, it needs to be qualified with additional questions as to, is this the smartest thing to do? I spoke a little bit about harm reduction. This kind of like gathered me in a, a, just a random conversation between two people in another country kind of like brought my name up and would I be willing to go before law enforcement individuals and basically talk to them about the criminalizing syringes because the organization that I, I work part-time with was talking about the criminalizing syringes. And I said, sure, absolutely. I think it's something that's important. Let me give you something that I haven't heard come up yet today. Something just to hang your, 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 just your thoughts on for one second. We conducted data over a period of time while going to, from county to county to county, talking to law enforcement officials, and this could be police, this could be deputies, this could be probation, parole, corrections, detention, and the like, park rangers, all right? And we spoke to them about their overall feelings about contracting any form of an infectious disease. Statistically at the time, in 2011, 2012, 33%, one out of every three law enforcement officials was stuck by a needle or syringe during the interaction or while conducting their day-to-day -day functions. This could be going in someone's pocket, on a shelf of a cabinet or a cupboard, or it could be some means of basically just um, um, putting a hand underneath the cushion in a car or whatever, 33%. The creepier thing about that particular number was the fact that 28% of those individuals would have a multi-stick, which means that they got stuck the first time, somewhere two, three years later, there was a multiple stick. Remember those numbers, 33%, 22%. Now, let me give you a vision picture of basically what this harm reduction model would be, what it would be as far as law enforcement is concerned. What harm reduction is, is, is proceeding forward with understanding people in a non-judgmental light, not project, um, projecting stigma towards them, understanding that, that drug use, substance use is a multifaceted, complex phenomena, understanding that, that the improvement in one's life should not be based off of the cessation or of, 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 of substance use or some form of abstinence, but based off of like simple things, quality of life things like, I don't have a home to live in, I just got an apartment. So in other words, your life quality did go up rather than saying, well, your life is still bad because you're still using um, heroin, all right? Now, this is, those are some of the fundamental things of what harm reduction is. In a law enforcement model, 
what harm reduction would simply be is, let's look at it from decriminalizing syringes, employing and administering 911 Good Samaritan statutes, having the naloxone Narcan being used and administered by any public official that's out there protecting the, the overall, their over, overall community. I already previously mentioned law enforcement assist diversion. Once again, not diversion against some type of substance use, but diversion away from the criminal justice system, taking a deeper look at saying, we don't need to arrest everyone to remove ourselves from these problems. And then the final part of the major part of that model would be SSPs, syringe service programs, being basically able to put a sterile syringe in the hand of someone that needs it solely for the purpose of mitigating risk, reducing negative consequences, promoting good health and preventing disease. And this is what a sterile syringe does. And this is what happens in syringe service programs. They kind of go hand in hand with the ability to be able to move freely through a community and get to a syringe service program, to move freely through a community and have the paradigm shift enough to say, in order for someone to exchange a syringe safely, they need to be able to carry the syringe without being having punitive action brought against them for it. Now, here's the number that I pretty much want to just challenge you with. And there's only a few things. I've always been marveled over the fact that any all participants that are connected to a syringe service program, as previously mentioned, have a five time greater likelihood of finding their way to treatment options. It's a phenomenal number. Additional numbers that you need to know, syringe service programs produce a component where crime in that particular county, that particular area, has statistically shown to go down by as much as 11%. This is a study done out of Baltimore City, and it connected outward to Baltimore County, where if there is not a syringe service program, all right, crime went up by 8%. So crime is going down to locations where there is a syringe service program, all right? The more obvious things would be that of HIV rates, transmission rates go down by 80%, hep C rates go down by 50%. But here's the part that I think we need to draw upon the most because this is affects the day-to-day -day operation of law enforcement officials. Remember, 33%, 28% sticks, then multiple sticks. In municipalities where there are syringe service programs and syringe criminalization, needle sticks go down by 66%, 66%. This means that there is a greater opportunity and chance that everyone goes home to their Bobby and Betty at the end of the evening. Everyone goes home, which is, should be the number one priority of every single public safety official. So in other words, the quest for achievement, the quest for success is not only to say we want to, better, we want to do better for our communities or we want to do better for the people that are, that are the people who, who, who use drugs, but also to say that we want to provide a greater and deeper and more meaningful service to the people that are serving the community. How could we serve them greater or better? And it starts with creating open dialogues. In North Carolina, there's a law that is it that if you are in possession of a needle or sharp and you make mention of that needle or sharp to a law enforcement official, you will not be prosecuted for, for such charge. Basically what is done is to create an open dialogue where a person will comfortably say, I'm in possession of two needles, I'm going to my syringe service program, I'm a participant there. And basically the communication hinges on basically saying, okay, fine, we will conduct our Kobayashi Maru and we will look at this and view this differently and we'll change the way we're thinking. Hagerstown, Maryland has a situation where there's a connectivity between law enforcement that, with the overall town and the community, in the community itself, primarily because they've been victim to like the six degrees of separation, which means some of their law enforcement agents have been victims of, of either substance use in their families or, or their loved ones or officers that are employed themselves. So it becomes very significant that basically we don't find a way to just detach, all right? And then the final thing I just really kind of want to say is the fact that with, with all of these changes, and there are so many changes, I realize that the, the, the greatest policing power is the utilization of discretion. The ability to, to, um, to make autonomous choices and decisions and in and, and moments when things are done in a split second, we're the ones that's choosing. We are the first line triage element to those things I mentioned, syringes, 911 Good Samaritan calls, naloxone, syringe service programs, law enforcement assisted diversion, which has evolved to where it's being utilized throughout the country as a means of simplifying and minimizing incarceration and arrest, specifically to misdemeanor offenses. What I would just really just challenge everyone is to say in this particular era, Somewhere along the way, law enforcement, public safety officials are confronted with this new decision, this new choice of how do we move forward? How do we put the vehicle in drive? 
How do we like set out for a new destination rather than being stuck in neutral or, or even worse yet, reversing back towards a policing format, a traditional policing format over the last 50 years that we've had minimal success with, if any success, in combating substance use disorder. Drive, neutral, or reverse. I would think the drive would be the particular direction that we would wanna go. Um, the Kobayashi Maru dictates that in order for us to do something and get different results, we need to do things differently. We have to proceed differently. We have to come up with something a little bit more creative, a little bit newer, just a little bit different. It doesn't mean that we become lesser of who we are. We've already become greater because we've already accepted so many new challenges. Um, in this instance, I do believe that the greatest reward is going to come to the fact that we're saving lives. We're going to, on an overall level, improve and increase the safety of our offices that are serving the community. And more effectively, we will be serving our community as a whole in a, in a, in a more effective way. Um, I'm just gonna close and say bye for any law enforcement officials that are listening to this. I support you tremendously. I support you wholeheartedly. There's not a day that I don't go where I don't speak of you as being the, the, the queen on the chessboard because you are instrumental in every single move and every single challenge that we encounter. I just implore and challenge you to, to wet your palate, be open and willing to like just changing to the new concepts of how we can move forward and it can effectively benefit everyone a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergeant Martin. Um, our next speaker is Corey Davis. Uh, Corey works at the Network for Public Health Law as a deputy director of their Southeastern Region Office and the director of the Harm Reduction Legal Project. Before joining the Network for Public Health Law, Corey served as an employment rights attorney at Equality Advocates Pennsylvania, where he represented LGBTQ individuals before um, administrative commissions and in state and federal courts. Prior to that, Corey oversaw a street-based legal clinic cited um, at Philadelphia's syringe exchange program. In both of these positions, he provided direct legal representation as well as education, outreach, and strategic advocacy. He's also worked for North Carolina Institute of Medicine, the University of Pennsylvania, and the Drug Control and Access to Medicines Consortium in both research and management capacities. He's the recipient of the International AIDS Society's Young Investigator Award given for empirical research on the effect of law and law enforcement practice on access to an evidence-based public health interventions. Corey received his BS from the Indiana University of Pennsylvania, wait, uh, and his MPH from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and his JD from Temple University. Great, thank you, Katie. Um, you uh, go to the next slide, please. All right. Um, well, so I, I guess one of the one of the uh, curses and benefits of going towards the end is that uh, so many of the great folks who have already talked have already covered a lot of the um, the important aspects of this presentation. But I, I want to go back over a few things and, and bring out a couple of, um, of aspects that hadn't been mentioned. So, you know, the starting point here is syringe access is good, right? Sometimes you'll hear people say, even people who should know better, like public health officials, something to the effect that injection drug use is a risk factor for HIV or injection drug use is a risk factor for bloodborne disease. That's not true. Right? That's not true. You can inject drugs every day uh, your entire life, and you have no increased risk of bloodborne disease transmission, either for yourself or for people you interact with. Lack of access to new syringes is the risk factor for bloodborne disease transmission. Right? So, if we make it so that everybody who injects drugs has ready access to uh, safer injection supplies, so syringes, as well as things like cookers and, and cottons and, and other things that people use as part of the injection process, um, that's going to dramatically decrease 
um, bloodborne disease risk. It will bring it down to zero if everybody has clean syringes every time um, they inject. We can also dramatically reduce things like infective endocarditis and so on, much of which is, uh, is also um, shared via bloodborne um, transmission through sharing syringes. But you can get all kinds of infections just by using you know, dirty syringes, by not having a safe, sterile place to inject, you know, not being able to um, sanitize your injection site, and so on. So just providing people with supplies, basic supplies, um, can dramatically reduce risks of all kinds of injection-related infections. Um, which again have much less to do with the injection. You know, people with diabetes, people with all kinds of chronic conditions inject themselves every day or several times a week. They are not at increased risk of bloodborne disease transmission. That's because it, it's you know not anything to do <laughs> with the activity itself. It's to do with lack of of safe supplies um, to do it. So you know, clear benefits for the people who are using drugs, as well as, you know, people in their, in their peer group, family, friends. Ron talked about the impact on officer needle stick injury. Could you um, just hit the, the forward arrow? Oh, there should be, huh. I thought there was a little, um, uh, could you go back one, sorry. I thought that there was a little, um, a little picture here, but anyway, um, so from the research that Dr. Ray did, you know, 24 officers um, in this study reported having a, um, a needle stick injury on duty. That comes to around 7%. Um, you know, like Ron said, that is probably an undercount. Some people may not be willing, wanting to admit that they have suffered a needle stick injury, but that's a lot. You know, 7% um, of the officers have suffered a needle stick injury while on duty. I mean, that's 7% too many, right? Um, you know, it's difficult to bring that number, number down to zero, just like it's difficult to bring that number down to zero in sort of the healthcare professions. But there are a lot of things that we can do to reduce that. And one of those things is that we can make it so that people who have syringes and, and needles on them are not afraid to tell the officer that they have them, right? So when you ask um, the person, you know, is there anything in your pockets that's, you know, going to poke me, you know, if it's a felony already, you're probably less likely to say, yeah, you know, you're probably much more likely to say no, or, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be searching through your car. Is there anything in there? You know, if you've got a, a, a syringe, you know, down behind the console or something, are you going to say yes? No, of course not. You know, if you know that you're looking at felony jail time, um, whereas if it's, you know, if it's not illegal and you trust that the police are not going to try to jack you up on it, you're much more likely to say like, yes, officer, it's in, you know, it's down my sock, whatever, it's in my pocket. Um, you know, uh, and that would decrease needle stick injury. And the research that we have uh, tells us that that's not a, you know, it's not theoretical, it's not hypothetical, that's actually what happens. Okay, uh, now if you could go to the next slide. So law is a removable barrier to syringe access, right? There is nothing natural or, um, you know, obvious about, um, you know, syringes being illegal, about law making it more difficult, um, to access syringes, those are laws that we have put in place, right? And, you know, they are having their intended effect, right? The goal of those laws is to punish people who inject drugs, to make it more difficult um, for them to access syringes, and they work. They do that, right? If you arrest people who use syringe services programs, they're less likely to use the program in the future, because of course they are, you know? Um, if you're fearful of the police, you are less likely to go to this place where they're giving out syringes, right? Um, like I you touched on in the previous slide, you know, people who are afraid of police interactions are also less likely to, you know, be careful to take the time to, like, you know, have a safe place to um, carefully 
um, prepare the drugs, to carefully um, you know, sanitize the area where you're going to inject because you're afraid, you know, like every minute that you're out in the open is a minute that, you know, you're afraid that some cops going to come by and arrest you. So you do all that stuff, you know, in a back alley somewhere, you know, you do it quickly. It's not um, anything that you would want for yourself. And it's nothing that, you know, we would recommend for others, but the law is designed to increase those sorts of things um, by making it, you know, you know, as difficult as possible for people to um, follow, um, you know, best practices for injection. Um, next slide, please. So I want to, um, you know, quickly talk about where these paraphernalia laws come from. It's like I said, you know, we have now had, you know, two, almost three generations of people who have grown up uh, in this um, era of criminalization of people who use some drugs, right? Um, you know, so it seems like now it's kind of the water in which we swim. You know, we have uh, just grown up, you know, in this, in this world in which it's just a given that uh, possession of some drugs, possession of some drug paraphernalia in most states is illegal. But like I said, that's, it hasn't always been that way. You know, these were specific laws that were, um, that were passed for specific purposes. And in fact, most states um, did not have anything that looks like um, modern paraphernalia laws or current paraphernalia laws, I should say, until the late 70s, early 80s. Um, Indiana is, is no exception. Um, the DEA put out a model paraphernalia law in 1979. Most states adopted it relatively wholesale in the early 80s. Indiana is actually sort of odd in that um, Indiana kind of crafted its own, um, but it was this you know, big push to criminalize paraphernalia, which previously had not been illegal. Um, you know, at the time, the goal was mostly to target, um, you know, hippies and people of color, right? So um, when you look at the model law, there's, you know, dozens <laughs> of different things that are targeted at, you know, all kinds of things for using marijuana, um, because that was one of the big, um, you know, counterculture populations that these things were aimed at and as well as injection drug use. And like I said, you know, the goal of these things um, was, um, you know, people are complicated. There were multiple goals. One of the main goals was to target these people um, who were deemed as sort of undesirable as, you know, annoying, um, you know, hippies, counterculture people, you know, leftovers from the 70s. Um, as well as people of color. And you can see that here, I can't move the, the pointer, but um, here you can see at the, on the right-hand side of the slides, um, you know, black people and white people use drugs, sell drugs at about the same rates. As far as we can tell, whites are actually as a percentage of population doing those things a little more um, than black people. But of course, you know, black people are much more likely to be arrested, much more likely to be prosecuted, much more likely to be incarcerated, and their uh, incarceration uh, stays are much longer. This is, you know, it, it, it's a circle, right? So you have systemic racism driving these things, and then once people, um, you know, get caught up in the system, systemic racism keeps them there. And at the bottom, you can see, you know, this dramatic increase in, um, people behind bars. Now, not all of that is caused by the war on drugs, but a whole lot of it is. You know, you can see this dramatic change um, in the number of people behind bars uh, starting in the late 70s and just, just creating this, this huge cliff. Um, so, you know, that is why paraphernalia laws. So if you could um, go to the next slide. I just want to hammer this home a little bit more because I think that we miss an important context if we don't, you know, consider the purpose 
of these laws, right? So, you know, the explicit and the implicit purpose. So this is a um, from a magazine article in Harper's that was written by this guy called Dan Baum, who was a New York Times reporter and then wrote a couple of you know really um, great books. He, he actually passed away brain cancer last year, but if you haven't if you haven't read his stuff, I really recommend it. But anyway, um, he wrote this article. He's you know talking about he he wrote this book on the drug war back in the 90s. And he was talking about this um, interview that he did with John Ehrlichman, who was um, President Nixon's domestic policy advisor and ended up um, you know, going to jail over the Watergate scandal and so on. Um, but you know, he wanted to ask him about sort of the war on drugs and other things. And this is a, a quote from, from John Ehrlichman, um, as reported by Dan Baum, who's you know, very, you know, mainstream, um, respectable guy. So the Nixon campaign in 1968 um, had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or to be black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and criminalize both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did, right? So this is, you know, from the horse's mouth, <laughs> explaining um, at least one rationale behind the ramp up of the war on drugs. And, you know, we all kind of know this, um, but it is sometimes helpful to see it there in black and white um, on the page. Um, okay, so uh, next slide, please. So like I said, most states, not all, but most states did adopt a paraphernalia law in the early 80s. Um, a lot of them are really similar. Like I said, Indiana's is a little different and it is particularly bad. So as others on the, on the um, meeting have said, possession of syringes for use in injecting illegal drugs is a felony. And not only is it a felony, the legislature moved it from a misdemeanor to a felony um, in the same session that created the syringe services program law. I don't know of any other state that's done that. Um, I know several states where it started a felony in the last few years has been moved uh, to a misdemeanor, but I don't know of any other state that has moved it from a misdemeanor to a felony. And in fact, I could find only a handful of other states where simple possession um, is a felony, and you probably wouldn't be shocked to, to discover that they are things you know, like Mississippi, um, you know, not places where there are um, super progressive policies. Um, so this is bad. Um, next slide, please. Um, you know, so there is this law that uh, permits syringe services programs in Indiana, as you all probably know, as others have talked about, it is um, a very limited carve out. It is very difficult um, to create a syringe exchange, exchange program in the state. You have to um, have, you know, an emergency already underway, right? And then you have to get approval. You have to, um, you know, have a medical professional overseeing the program. There is a lot of red tape um, involved with starting a syringe exchange program because, again, you know, the goal here is we still want to make sure everybody understands that drugs are bad. People who use drugs are bad. People who inject drugs are bad. But we're going to have like a limited carve out that if you jump through a bunch of hoops, and you can like show up at a certain date at a certain time, we're gonna let you get away with it kind of me, right? Like that is the idea behind the SSD. Um, okay, next, next slide, please. So again, like what are we trying to accomplish here, right? You know, like if the goal is to have racially disparate policing, if the goal is to make sure that people who use drugs are unsafe, that they're sick, um, like, that's good, like that's what we're doing. Um, if the goal is to save money, you know, prevent diseases, prevent disability and so on, like it's bad. 
So assuming that our goal is the second, how do we do that? Uh, next slide, please. So we need to flip the paradigm, right? So the current law is set up to discourage syringe access. We want to encourage syringe access. How do we do that? Well, um, the best way that we do that is to repeal the paraphernalia laws. I mean, in a pinch, you can just carve syringes out, but you really should just repeal them altogether, right? So it is no longer a crime to have a syringe on you. And then you want to prohibit municipalities from playing games and criminalizing them at the local level. Um, and then once you have that, you want to make sure that you're funding these evidence-based programs that reduce costs and, and reduce um, bloodborne disease infections, syringe services programs. Next slide, please. Um, is paraphernalia decriminalization some kind of you know, hippie fever dream? Like, no, um, it's the reality in a number of states. Alaska just never got around to criminalizing paraphernalia at all. They just never passed a paraphernalia law. They've never had one. It's fine. There's a random assortment of other states that also just never criminalize the possession or the free delivery of syringes. Um, and, you know, it's everything from, you know, Michigan, Massachusetts to South Carolina. You know, these are just states that for whatever reason uh, just never criminalize those things. And again, it's working fine. Um, there have been states recently that have specifically changed their laws to decriminalize syringe possession. DC did it last year. Um, there's a bill sitting with the Maryland governor that's expected to become law that does that. Um, I, I put just uh, copied and pasted this um, thing from the legislative summary of, Mar of Maryland's bill, which basically says it's going to save the state money. Um, these are just direct expenditures. You know, you're fewer people in jail you're spending less money. It doesn't even get into all of the you know, decreased costs from fewer people getting HIV and hepatitis and so on. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so why decriminalize paraphernalia? Well, criminalization of paraphernalia is bad. It increases risks to people who inject drugs. It increases risks to people in the community. It increases risks to law enforcement officers. You know, so you're spending money to make people sick and cost yourselves more money. Uh, you know, again, it's like, what are your goals, right? If you think that it's so important to um, stigmatize people who inject drugs and show, you know, that we are superior to them because we don't inject drugs, um, you know, maybe it's worth it. You know, maybe that is a good use of taxpayer money, of law enforcement time, and so on. Um, or you could decide, you know, like actually we think these are human beings and we don't want to spend a bunch of public money making them sicker. And, and instead we would like to, you know, to the extent that we're spending public money, help people be healthier, help people be safer. You know, that's a decision um, that the state can make. Um, I would say, you know, I am not in Indiana. I am not in the, the um, uh, you know, the, the law enforcement administration, but I would say, you know, law enforcement agencies in general do have a lot of discretion, particularly on things like this. Um, they could decide to dramatically decrease the amount of people that they are arresting for simple syringe possession, even outside um, passage of a new law. It doesn't seem um, like at least in Marion County, they have decided to do that. Um, so therefore, you know, you need to change the law. But I would say, you know, I just want to make clear that that is generally an option. Um, next slide, please. All right, so, so that's it. Um, you know, nearly every syringe-related infection is preventable. Syringe services programs help, um, but they're not the only thing, right? You, you don't want syringes only to be accessible in the context of an SSP because, you know, what if you you know, don't have a car. What if it's far away or it's only open certain hours? You know, you want syringes just to be legal. And then you figure out how do we best get syringes to people um, who need them. And, you know, if, uh, if, you, you know, if we keep doing what we're doing, we're going to keep getting the results that we're getting. So if we want different results, we have to change. Um, and, you know, I think that the best way to do that is to change the law to decriminalize uh, paraphernalia. Um, thank you.
Thank you very much, Corey. Um, we have a few minutes left. We're going to answer some of the questions that I see popping up in the Q&A. Um, I think we'll start with if Madison, you could tell us um, a little more about the, the information that was provided to officers about the SSP participation cards and what officers understood about what they could do in a situation where they were presented with one. Absolutely. So I think we had a slide earlier on that showed a sample of what the card may look like. Um, on our cards, we keep the on, only Indiana law that protects certain service participants, which is that you cannot uh, target a person simply because they're a member of the exchange. So a, a officer can't camp at all around the corner and then wait for people to leave. So they didn't use their turn signal and then uh, pull them over. It was um, told to officers over and over again, it's completely your discretion. Discretion is your most powerful tool. Uh, so just recognize that people that are participating in the exchange are doing so willingly. They're taking a step towards recovery by participating. Uh, actually, just last week, I interacted with law enforcement. Um, there was actually a speed trap that was occurring at the same time as the exchange exchange, just like two blocks away, which was not ideal. Um, I went over there to talk to the officers and um, actually I had a very good interaction, but they needed that refreshment on, you know, oh yeah, what are we supposed to do if somebody shows us their card? And I was like, oh, you know, that's within your power. It is, you know, uh, your discretion. If they can tell you where the syringes are, then I, I would encourage you to exercise your discretion, but that's your choice. Thank you. Um, and something else I want to add to that, when I talked about how we um, provided those educational sessions for um, police where we showed the syringe card and explained to them what it was. Um, we did those sessions for IMPD only. So if someone gets stopped by like Indiana Sheriff Association or any other type of police district or someone from out of the county, an officer from out of the county, they did not receive the educational training. Um, so they might not be in the loop and might not know what the card is or what to do with the card. So that is one limitation of, of the educational session that we did. Um, I want to direct a question to Captain Hunter, um, who's a police officer that was involved in presenting SHIELD in Indiana. Um, could you just tell us a little more about the SHIELD program and the role that you played? Yes, uh, thanks for that question. So uh, the SHIELD program uh, is really important for officers because uh, we give you uh, strategies to really work on the issues that you're coming across every day. So um, signs and symptoms of high stress and toxic stress and how to deal with those. And we uh, also discuss suicide. Um, we give you uh, key facts to lower your stress levels and um, help you work through that stress. And then uh, the third module that we talk about are giving you two strategies to um, reduce your contact and reduce your risk to lower those, those threats. And really uh, trying to triage cases or uh, either going remote or actually outsourcing your contacts to other agencies such as harm reduction, syringe service program or treatment providers is one way to reduce your uh, contact. And then reducing your risk, we um, show you best practices on how to search people and um, basically helping you manage those visuals to to uh, foster trust. And we really talk about using your power of discretion, which again, is so huge and so helpful. Thank you. Um, I think this might be a, a, for Madison, but um, to what extent has the state um, considered changing the felony uh, possession charge that you know of? That's a, that's a complicated answer. Um, there's been talks with HIV prevention folks, with harm reduction folks about what that might look like. And there have been a few different iterations come up over the last few years. Uh, this last session we had uh, within an HIV prevention bill that if somebody discloses, discloses that they have syringes on them, that then those charges would not uh, be applicable. But uh, historically because syringe exchange has to be renewed like every two years, all of our legal efforts go towards that. 
towards making sure that our legislators understand the importance of syringe exchange itself. And you know, doing the education with law enforcement is very similar to what it is with our participants. And we had a lot of officers that said, you know, like, I wouldn't care as long as it wasn't against the law for them to have the syringes. Like, I feel like I'm between a rock and a hard place. And because this is the law, I'm gonna continue to arrest people. Uh, that's just the way it is. And our participants kind of feel the same way where we have people that won't utilize us. Uh, there are officers that see each syringe as a separate charge. So if you go to the exchange and we give you 50 syringes, we've not only increased the likelihood that you could be caught with syringes since one syringe is harder to hide than 50 are, um, but if you get in with an officer that is very strict on this law, you could be looking at 50 charges. I know that's not a really great answer, but that's where we are. Thanks, Madison. Um, we've come to the 2.30 mark. Unfortunately, I know there's lots of questions that would be great to talk through um, with this awesome panel of, of presenters. I'm going to turn it over to, to Dr. Ray to just make a closing remark. So yeah, thanks for joining us everybody today. Um, I wanna just give a special thank you to Madison and all the folks that are doing like the on the ground harm reduction work in Indianapolis. That's, that's what's making a big difference. So thank you for all that you do, Madison. Um, and I also just wanna thank everybody for joining us here today. You know, we put a lot of energy into this work. I hope everybody uh, learned something. Some, for some of you, it might've been some information that you didn't know before. For others of you, it might've been, um, you know, a new way to look at this particular issue. But I hope everybody can see the policy implications of using the full force of the US criminal justice system on people for possessing a syringe. The effects ripple throughout society, they ripple throughout the system, the criminal legal system, and they have very dire consequences. So thanks for joining us here today. We'll have this presentation um, online and we'll let folks know when that gets there. So thank you all, have a good afternoon.